So um, we got, um, I'm going to talk about education for life a little bit and later on in the program. Uh, but I wanted to start with the topic for the day. Um, there's a whisper from eternity that I wanted to read to you. Seek not to be deceived by the senses. O divine teacher, train me to recognize the difference between my soul's lasting happiness and the passing pleasures of the senses. Keep my eyes open that I be not deceived by my senses, decked out as they are in stolen rat royal trappings and in the mirage cloak of false happiness, as thus disguised they try to enter the mansion of my life. Discipline my unwise wayward senses that my pleasures be spiritualized. And I look ever beyond the illusion of glittering visible forms to find divine joy hidden, simply dressed in the white robe of humility. Okay. So the topic today, you know, is, is the kind of the essential one, the difference between light and darkness. And uh, the, the reading today, uh, I was looking at it, and it starts out with this little uh, quote from Isaiah in the Bible. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. So as most of you know, the Old Testament gets a little more dramatic than... <laughs> uh, maybe current conversation would, uh, would uh, honor, but uh, talking about people who walked in darkness in the land of the shadow of death. Um, so it's a pretty uh, dynamic or what do I, I'm not sure what the word I want, but uh, extreme way of describing the world of the senses. Um, because we, you know, we think of the world of the senses, oh, it's not so bad. You know, it's, uh, there's ice cream, there's uh, new cars, there's uh, all these different things that, things that kind of uh, grab our attention. And, you know, Master puts it in a little different light, although he's, he's just as extreme in terms of wanting to, us to get out of it. But he talks about it as a movie. And it's a metaphor he uses a lot. It says, the material world is a movie. And it's there uh, for a reason. He says it's there to educate and entertain us. And uh, so it has a, a real purpose. It also, you know, we, we don't have a lot of choice. We have to engage in it. But how we engage is the whole secret. Do we jump in, feet first, hands, arms, <laughs> head, heart, soul, everything, and immerse ourselves in the, in the world of the senses. Well, if we do that, then we've entered the the land of how does it say it? the shadow, land of the shadow of death, um, and we're walking in darkness. Because, of course, we all you know know this that uh, we wouldn't be you, people wouldn't be here at this service if they hadn't at least started to you know reexamine this that this. This land of the senses is incapable of satisfying us. It simply cannot. It's just simply like comparing um, asteroids and peanuts. <laughs> They're in two different realities. Um, the senses you know, have their reality. They have a whole way they fit together. But uh, this, the pleasures of the senses are inevitably their passing. They're they're superficial they uh they we can get tired of them very easily think of that you, you know take your favorite flavor of ice cream and then imagine yourself eating it non-stop for a day and a half or even non-stop for a couple of hours you would get really sick of it really fast <laughs> and it's just the way of that of the material world it's just simply it's why uh Automakers are constantly coming up with new cars because they know that if they put the same car out there, people wouldn't be drawn to it anymore because uh, you get tired of it. 
no matter what it is. So, uh, so we have this challenge in front of us. How do we, how do we approach it? How do we deal with it? Well, most people, are, most of the people on the planet right now are just lost in it. They're they're lost in this 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 way of darkness. They uh, may not have. Um, well, they haven't. They haven't gotten to the point where they went out. Otherwise, they would start seeking, and then they would find some answer to their their uh, search. So, uh, most of this planet is simply uh, people in this in the darkness talking to other people in the darkness, and uh, it's simply it's it's not going. It's not going to solve anything in the long term. So, but gradually, one by one. We start to question. We start to say, "Wait a minute! I think there's got to be there's got to be something else. This can't be all. This can't be. If this is all, <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> I I got to get something else that's going to uh, draw my attention. And so we start looking. We start looking for a way out. And um, and it, you know, Jesus says, "Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be open." Um, so that's all we really have to do is start to ask, start to put out that energy of what else is there? It doesn't have to be a nice, neat prayer because often people in that stage, they don't have any real concept of God, what God might be. And maybe they've rejected the whole idea of God altogether because it was presented to them in a, in a way that was not very uh, palatable to them. Um, but you start to get to, uh, you start to, you know, you, you do put out this, this kind of cry of desperation. Uh, Swami's story is, is a great model. You know, he's in New York. He's 23 years old. He's gone through most of college, although he didn't finish because he didn't, he wasn't giving him the answers he wanted. He's considered pretty much everything, being a hermit, uh, just He's just floundering and flashing, thrashing out to say, what in the world is this place? And he goes to that bookstore, um, downtown New York, and he goes back to this book that he'd rejected a couple of weeks before because it was dedicated to an American saint. And he was so turned off on America, the America that he had been raised in, that the thought of an American saint was totally repugnant to him. <laughs> it's impossible. It couldn't possibly be because I, I know America. I've lived here. I've been here for however many years he'd been in the United States. And he goes, but he goes back to that book because he feels drawn to it on a different level. He feels drawn to it, not on an intellectual level, not, not through the senses. He doesn't feel drawn to that book through the senses. He feels drawn to it through intuition. And maybe for the first time in his life, Maybe because he's so desperate, he decides to honor that intuition that he's having, even though that intuition may not make sense, it may not be logical. I know my own experience with Autobiography of Yogi, I, I, was, I was brought to it exactly at the right moment because I was also extremely desperate at that point. If I'd been brought to it six months earlier, I would have closed the book on the third page because they started talking about miracles. They started talking about things that I could not relate to from my Western intellectual upbringing. And I would have rejected it. But just like Swami, I was desperate. And I read that and because I was drawn by this, something deeper, it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me that Lahiri Mahashaya was manifesting in a meadow. <laughs> I just said, okay, maybe so, I don't know. But, but, um, but there's something pulling me in this way. And that was what, of course, Swami was feeling too. And the power of Swami's connection was so strong that he basically closed up shop in New York. He got rid of everything. He hopped on the bus, next bus he could get on. And he went across the United States to Los Angeles. Um, so that, that kind of pull is, you know, it kind of depends on the desperation. And the, if you're kind of only a little mildly irritated at the material world, maybe you won't make that jump. <laughs> you might say, huh, that's interesting. This guy's talking about something else. Maybe I'll check back on it later. But if you happen to have the blessing, it doesn't look like a blessing at the time, the blessing that everything else is cut off, everything else looks like a dead end, or you know it's a dead end because you've, you've checked it out. 
then that power of that pull is going to be tremendously helpful to you in, in getting on the path and getting into the spiritual work that we need to do. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, dynamic that we can, we can see. Um, we have to, you know, basically what we have to do is relearn. We have to relearn how to relate to the material world. And it's a very long process um, for almost all of us, <clears throat> unless we have amazing karma from past lives or we have incredible karma in this life. Because we're having to kind of whack our way through the wilderness of, uh, of delusion <clears throat> that we've been living in for so many years. And we've made so many uh, commitments to the material world, things that we've said, oh, this is important. I've got to do this. I have to take care of this. I have to, all these have tos that we've done uh, because we think the material world is the full reality. Well, once we get on the path, we're having to learn to approach it in a different way that material world is only a limited reality. It is real, but there's this whole other world of the spirit world of the non-sensory uh, experiences that we can have that we, um, we have to learn to integrate. So we go out to uh, buy that new car. Well, we've been raised to look at, well, I think about horsepower is important. I think that uh, having a good color of the uh, upholstery is important. All these other things that I think are important that I used to put at the forefront of my interaction with material world, now I have to put it in the back seat. Now I have to say, you know, master, God, gurus, what car is right for me? <laughs> what car do you want me to have? And then put that in the front seat and say, okay, and then whether it has the right color, um, well, that's not so important. That's the story of that lady that master gave a, uh, pink rose too. And she looked at him and said, oh, I wanted a white one. And he says, I'm giving you a pink one. <laughs> you know, just like, okay, don't worry about that, those, those little things anymore. Just get in tune, get in tune. Well, of course, how do you get, what do we get in tune with? Well, we have the blessing of having an avatar um, that we can work with. Or actually a whole line of avatars. But what is an avatar? It's simply you know, somebody that figured it out. Somebody that figured it out that how to put the material world in the right perspective and learn to work through that on all levels. There's simply no other level that can test them anymore. They, they understand it completely. There's nothing in the material world that's gonna put their consciousness and capture it in a little tiny bubble that we, most of us have lived in in the past. So we, we know, we work with master. We, you know, we don't really understand who master is. Uh, it's impossible for us, but we, we try to look for ways that we can connect. You know, we, we chant, we have Sunday services, which is wonderful. We meditate, which is best of all. The fact that you guys are meditating is fabulous uh, for an hour before this talk. Um, you know, we have all these different tools he's given us, energization exercises, um, satsang. Uh, he talks about how satsang is stronger than willpower for almost everybody. Unless until your willpower gets really strong. So looking for ways to have satsang, looking for ways to have community. Um, so we have all these ways, all these tools that we've been given, and it's all basically to learn how to relate, uh, I'll say properly, to the material world. Um, it's a huge challenge, we, like I said, because we have a lot of unlearning to do. So this is where I want to segue into education for life. <laughs> because this is what I've worked with for my whole life, basically, um, since I got to Ananda. Is it possible to raise children differently? Is it possible to raise children where they're not completely absorbed in the material world? Um, so one of the first lines I came across 50 years ago when I was uh, just trying to explore these things was a quote of masters, it's in uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, his commentary is in the Bhagavad Gita. If young people, before getting entangled in worldly life, experience the bliss of meditation, they're little likely to fall victim in later years to the ubiquitous sense delusions. 
So he's pointing out here a possibility. It's a possibility that he um, started, or he, what's the word I want? He uh, pioneered back in Ranchi in 1916, 17, 18, and 19, before he came to the West. He started a school. Why did he start the school? Not because he wanted to get special SAT scores or get people into college. He started a school to show that you could actually train children, not, not train, train's the wrong word. You could support children in cultivating their inner life. You could have a school that didn't just focus on the senses, that also empowered them on this deeper level of their own inner life. Um, one of the teachers here at the village for as long as almost as long as I've been here, Toby Narani Morehouse wrote a book, Supporting Your Child's Inner Life. And that word supporting is so strong because children have an inner life. <laughs> if you've ever been around a little child, they have an inner life. They come in with it. They come in because they've been in another sphere before they come into this material world that's, that's very vibrant to them still. And if they're born into a situation where nobody else has any awakening, nobody else has any sense of that there is anything beyond the material world, that inner life gets crushed pretty quickly. Um, it's the blind leading the blind. Probably most of you had that experience. You came in with an inner life and nobody around you was able to cultivate it. Nobody all around you was able to recognize it, to value it, to see why it was so important and to help validate it in you. And so it gradually died out or I got, died is the wrong word. It got, gradually went to sleep, gradually went to sleep. And you might have, depending on your own experience you might have memories of, wow, I remember, I remember this joy I felt you know, Swami talks about in the path, he talks about he was, I don't know, four or five years old, maybe younger, and he's under a, a table and he's arranged it so these blankets go, go over the edges of the tables and reach down to the floor. So he's in this kind of a mini world that he's created. He describes the tremendous joy he was feeling in that experience. And that's just one sample. Uh, the blessing in my life, one of the big blessings, uh, is being able to be around little kids a lot um, and kids that are, haven't lost that touch. And the experiences that they'll come out with, of just with that joy will just come out in very unusual experiences, or very common experiences sometimes. I have to take, I have a grandson now, he's uh, almost three years old. So they came up to visit about two weeks ago and they, we wanted to go, they wanted to go down to the river. So we went down to the river and, you know, we're just kind of hanging out together. And then I just noticed that he was really, you know, we were in the water, but he was really drawn to the rocks. And we just started, you know, playing with rocks. We started moving rocks around for about 45 minutes. <laughs> and he was just absorbed in it. He was completely there. He was completely involved. And, and there was just this sense of, expansion and peace that was coming out of him um, earlier in his life he started to outgrow this but when he was one and two his favorite thing was to swing <laughs> and he if i took him down to the whatever playground wherever we were and put him in the swing those little ones you know the ones that hold you in because he's too little for the ones where he has to hold himself in and i would just push him back and forth he was in ecstasy. I called it baby ecstasy, baby samadhi. He wouldn't say anything. He, was, he wouldn't move his head. He was awake, but he was just in this state of absorption and the, and with the movement swinging back and forth. And I, it would be like 45 minutes. I'd be there pushing him. <laughs> uh, he would outlast me usually. My, I would start to get, my legs would give out or something else would give out. Where, but he was still right there wanting to he just was so into that. And then, you know, the next time we, we would be together, he would say, can we go swing? <laughs> and so we'd go do it again. And uh, so if you have a person in your life, if you had a person in your life who was able to recognize those moments in you, that part of you and, and support it, you had an incredible blessing. You had an incredible blessing because you were able to carry that sense of, awe, that sense of 
attunement with those deeper levels deeper into your life. And like Master says, if you can keep it there up until, you know, ideally you want to make it into the teenage years because the teenage years, the senses just go bananas. They just explode. And, you know, got all those hormones behind it. And that's when people really get locked in. If you, if you haven't had an experience of, of that deeper part of yourself before then, you're going to be stuck for a couple of decades. <laughs> and uh, maybe, you know, you can work your way out a little bit later. But, um, but if you have had it, you can even, you know, people, I, watch, I, get, to watch, I get to work with te teenagers a lot now. Uh, we have an online high school. And we just had our first online graduation. Uh, had three young women, one from Iran. It's an international high school. One of, you can do that now, of course, with the internet. Um, one from Iran, one from India, and one from Italy. And it was such a deep blessing to be around them because they still have that inner quality alive, and they they're 18 years old, and they're ready to go out into their to their adult life. But they're fully fully uh, primed to know that they, they don't want to let go of that. They don't want to, they, they, nothing's more important than that sense of inner peace, that sense of inner connection. And so when they go out, um, you know, like one, as one girl put it, she says, my standards are a lot higher now. <laughs> I'm not going to put up <laughs> with stuff that I, uh, that a lot of people put up with. So that's the uh, vision. The vision is what would happen to this planet? Imagine, what would happen to this planet if most of the people on the planet had that inner life awake, still awake, and they were, they were carrying that with them? We would be in a very, very different world. <laughs> Can you imagine if your politicians all had that experience, that was part of them, no matter whether they were Democrats or Republicans? <laughs> we would have a different way of relating to each other. We would have a different style. We would have different ways that neighborhoods would function. We have different ways that jobs function. Everything would be different. And of course, that's the reason that Master came into this world at this time. He said, it's time. We cannot keep up with this old sense-bound way of thinking. Uh, he even said it. It's just right now, if we don't awaken the spiritual life, we'll just simply uh, destroy ourselves be with the, because the technology is so uh, empowered now that we now can, we can destroy the planet. We all know that. So Master said, this is the timing right now is essential. He said, we aren't going to just blow ourselves up. But the reason we're not going to blow ourselves up is not because of uh, uh, technology. It's because the spiritual awakening that he brought forth is going to spread. It's going to spread like wildfire. Um, and it's going to be the sa savior of this planet. Um, so we're all involved in that. We're all connected with that in some way. We're, we all, I, I love Maitri's prayer, we're all trying to become instruments for helping the avatars, helping the gurus, helping the divine bring that reality to more and more people. The reality that there's more to life than the senses, there's more to life than the material world. The material world is not bad, the material world is just limited <laughs> and we cannot put all of our all of our eggs in that basket. Otherwise, we'll just reap the harvest of, of um, death, as the Isaiah says, just the spiritual death. So um, I think that, that's kind of what I wanted to just bring up today. And I thought uh, I would just share that with you. So <laughs> now I actually says you have a wonderful, another part of you have a Q&A at the end. So I'd love to see what that's like. <laughs> Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Nitai. What we will ask people to do now, we're gonna we're gonna go off Facebook, and um, and then people are welcome to open their cameras, their mics, or put it in the chat box. Any questions? Anything you want to comment on that uh, Nitai has spoken about? Anything you want to ask at all? This is your opportunity, and um, I, I will start with just a little mundane thing because well, a couple weeks ago I was looking for that exact quote about um, what Master had said um, 
we're here to be educated and entertained. And I, I knew, you know, I've heard it a zillion times, but I couldn't find where it was. I was wondering if you knew exactly where that came from. That's, that's putting you on the spot, but if you by any chance do. I'd have to look at, I'd have to spend a little time, you know, looking on the internet, but you, you know, you try to pick up key phrases that you know are the exact words, like uh, educated and entertained. Yeah. <laughs> and put Yogananda next to it and you have a chance to pull it up that way. Um, I don't know where it is actually right now. Well, I just just wondered because I was searching for it and I was trying to do that on the internet and I couldn't find, I knew, you know, I knew it's there somewhere, but <laughs> since you brought it up, I thought I would, would ask well, you, I'd start you off with it. Part of that was, but so few are either educated or entertained. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, anybody else have a question right off the bat? I we want to encourage those that somehow sometimes feel a little shy to. We'll take a moment, a pause here. <laughs> we got Can a quiet question. Okay. You have a, somebody has a question. Okay. There's Linda. Okay, Linda. You have to unmute though. Okay. Oh, hey, Nita. Right. Um, yeah, so my, uh, I've got two teenagers now. <laughs> and, um, you know, <laughs> they were, unfortunately, our local uh, center didn't have, you know, a critical mass for a school, um, even though, you know, we talked about it and we did our best and all that. But, um, and it's just difficult in a Metroplex like this to find that kind of, you um, opportunity i guess um and so i don't know I, hopefully it's not over yet even though there are teenagers um do you have any other ideas about how we can keep them you know engaged and exposed to things other than their screens hmm. uh, it's, well you know the screens aren't all bad either although they can certainly get overdone but uh, in any avenue you know, our, the role, your role as a, not only as a mother, but as a, a devotee is just to encourage anything that takes them up upwards, anything that brings them back to that inner, inner self. So sometimes, you know, if you look carefully in what's available on the screen, you can say, hey, you know, I found, this thing. you know, let's, can I, let's, I'd like to watch it with you, or I'd like to, you know, share it with you or something. And, you know, it's a give and take when they're, by, by the time they're that old, which is okay. But maybe some of the time they will, they will say, "Okay, mom, sure," <laughs> and uh, you know you can share it with them and uh, just kind of tune in. I mean, there's little things like uh, I remember Swami saying that Bambi was his favorite movie, <laughs> and uh, um, so you know there's nothing overtly spiritual about Bambi, but there's a vibration in it that's uplifting, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so you can, and then having a little discussion with them afterwards about, well, you know, how did you feel? What did, what did it feel like to, you know, what, what did you see? What was your perspective? Engage them in a conversation. So they at least have a chance to share whatever, you know, whatever uplifting inner in, uh, awakening thoughts they might have. And you just can be surprised. Uh, again, you're not trying to teach them. You're not trying to lecture to them. You're just trying to open them up, ask them questions, draw it out. Again, that's, that's that, I just had this thing with, uh, we were trying to do some things in India right now, and this lady used the word inculcating. And I said, no, no, <laughs> we're not trying to put something in there. It's already, it's already there. We're trying to just awaken it and draw it out and uh, validate it. So, uh, because otherwise you get the opposite, you know, we all, most of us had that. Our spirit, our religious religion was inculcated on us <laughs> and it was pushed on us and we were supposed to you were supposed to receive it and either you had to submit or you rebelled so it was uh, it's not either neither one of those is very uh, a very healthy approach 